Whether you like Star Wars or not, if I say Death Star, you immediately know what I'm talking about. When Rogue One came out, I saw it in IMAX, and I was not prepared to watch the Death Star fire. Talk about a truly terrifying amount of energy. Now, obviously it was fiction, so you couldn't actually build a laser that big, right? Well, maybe. If you pay attention to the movie, and nerd out a bit and read the prequel novel, they talk extensively that the kyber crystals used to power the laser are used up like fuel, unlike in a lightsaber where they do some focusing sci-fi magic. To me, that sounds more like a chemical laser than anything. In both cases, you use a fuel of some sort put through a special reactor to make your laser light. There's lots of very real chemical lasers, and they can pack a hell of a punch. So let's explore chemical lasers and get a glimpse of how a real Death Star could be made and what could be used to power it. Chemical lasers share a lot of the same basic pieces of a traditional laser, but have some new ones added in to replace the usual electronics. As with most lasers, they require an optical cavity to work. This is a fancy way of saying two mirrors aimed at each other so that whatever light is produced can bounce back and forth a few times and amplify before it escapes at the front of the laser. One of the mirrors reflects almost all of the light, while one of them is made a little bit less reflective so that some of the light can escape. Different designs use different mirror shapes, but that doesn't really matter as it's a fine-tuning thing. Really, the heart of these lasers, though, is the chemicals that produce the light itself. Just like in Star Wars, you need a substance that holds an immense amount of energy, and you need a way to release it in a useful form. In the movie, they use kyber crystals, but in reality, you're probably more likely to use a mixture of gases as you can keep the components separate until they're needed. Just to be really upfront about this, none of the gases used in any of these systems are pleasant by any means. All of that stored chemical potential energy makes them extremely reactive, and they're usually toxic, explosive, or extremely corrosive. Often all three. Rather than just listing off all the things that can be used, let's go through one example, as the rest work in a very similar manner. We're going to be looking at all gaseous iodine lasers, or agile lasers to start with. The reason we're looking at these specifically is that because they're all gas-based, they could work in space, and due to the lightweight nature of the fuel they use, are most likely to be used in flight situations. In the first agile laser that was built, they used five gases for the reaction. Deuterium chloride, nitrogen trifluoride, gaseous hydrozoic acid, hydrogen iodide, and helium as an inert carrier. There are a few steps to the reaction, and you need to put the gases into the reaction chamber in a particular order so the correct reactions get going and aren't outcompeted by ones that don't produce laser light. So the vent holes in the reactor are placed in order to let the gases in at the right times. The point of all of these reactions is to get to two end products, one that passes its energy to the other and one that releases light. The end products we want are chloronitrine and singlet iodine, but we can't just start with those and mix them, both because they're unstable and decay quickly, and we need them in special excited states. So we have to use other chemical reactions to get them to that point. Think of it like the DPSS lasers we looked at a couple of weeks ago. You have to pass the energy around to get to where you want. You can't just skip to the end, so to speak. First, the nitrogen trifluoride is put through a discharge tube to separate it into individual fluorine atoms. The little bit of high voltage is enough to split it into the form that we need. Then, deuterium chloride is reacted with the monoatomic fluorine gas to form chlorine gas in an excited state and deuterium fluoride. The newly formed chlorine reacts with the hydrozoic acid to form triplet nitrogen. This is very unstable and reacts with more of the chlorine gas to form chloronitrine and diatomic nitrogen gas, which is stable. Conveniently, the chlorine also reacts with hydrogen iodide to produce monoatomic iodine, which is the unstable form that we want. The chloronitrine can finally then pass its energy to the iodine and release it as light at 1.315 micrometers, which is in the infrared range. Since this wavelength of light isn't absorbed by the fused silica used to make fiber optics, you can pipe the laser light far away from the reaction to wherever you need it. And because this wavelength is absorbed by metals and other materials, it can be used to cut, heat, or ablate them. Another nice thing is the simplicity of the reactor for this particular laser. It's really just a tube with a couple of gas inlets and a vacuum port, a high voltage discharge tube for the fluorine, and some windows for the light to escape. And because everything is done at a soft vacuum pressure, we're not using a ton of gas at a time. Most gases are fed in at millimoles per second, which is a tiny amount of gas, and everything was done at 20 torr, though that obviously scales with size. This concept of getting compounds into an excited state and then handing that energy off to a different compound that can laze is the basis for all chemical lasers. Coil lasers use singlet oxygen, others use deuterium fluoride, and so on. Almost all of them work in the infrared range, but you can always use a nonlinear crystal to shift the wavelength into the visible range if for some reason you wanted your Death Star to have a colorful beam like in the movie. Though, if you use frequency doubling, you'll have a red Death Star laser, not a green one. If that sentence made no sense to you, then go back and watch my DPSS laser video to learn more about how that works. The nice thing with chemical lasers is they scale up very easily. So long as you can supply the right amount of gas, you can build one as large as you want, theoretically. Or you could build a bunch of smaller ones and pipe the light where you need it and combine it all together. 
In the Death Star, there were eight reactors that produced the laser light, so you can throttle the power by adjusting how many reactors you use. Chemical lasers like this could be used in exactly the same way. Because of how compact these lasers are, and because they need very little input electrical energy, the military is already putting them to use in various planes as weapon and defense systems. The first Agile laser put out about 15 watts, which isn't a huge amount of energy, but the thing was only 20 centimeters long. The military ones are much larger and can put out a continuous beam with millions of watts of power so long as you keep the gas flowing. They're also starting to be used in industry for quickly cutting metal. Now for caveat time. To blow up a planet the size of the Earth, there's a lot of forces you're going to need to overcome. The gravitational energy alone would mean that you need to input more than 2 times 10 to the 32 joules of energy. That doesn't even include all the chemical binding energy of all the rocks and minerals and fluids and oceans and everything else on and in Earth. That's more energy than the sun puts out in a week, and you'd need to do that in a second. And since we're talking chemical energy, it's much less efficient than fusion that occurs in the sun, meaning you need even more fuel. To be fair, if you can build a thing the size of the moon, maybe these are things you've overcome already. Maybe you mine asteroids for the starting material, and your Death Star has a factory built in to convert them into the correct gases. Or maybe you found a fuel that was both extremely volatile and infinitely renewable. Either way, there is a nugget of viability to the Death Star, assuming those technical challenges could be overcome. So those are chemical lasers, a really interesting way of generating laser light that is very different than anything we're used to. And who knows, maybe some mad scientist one day will build one big enough to burn their initials into the moon, or will be hired to build a real Death Star. If you like this video and want to see more cool laser stuff, I have a few different laser videos already up on the channel, and I've linked to them in the description. I've also linked to the papers that this was based on and some more reading material as I had to glaze over some details for the sake of the video. Speaking of lasers and optics, have you checked out these cool posters I have on my store on Redbubble? If not, you should head over there and snag one for yourself, and while you're there, be sure to check out some of the other cool designs I already have up. And with that, I'll wrap up this video. If you enjoyed and want to see more, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so the YouTube AI remembers to show the videos to you. Theoretically. As always, a big thanks to my patrons who help make these videos possible. Your continued support is appreciated so much and is part of what drives me to keep these videos coming out on time. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.